Welcome to Let's Talk Tango with Sean and Allison. I'm Allison. This week, we hear from Sean. How did a chance encounter on top of one of the world's most iconic landmarks lead him down into the sultry dens of tango? He got lost, but it's pretty amazing what he found. Then, we have a tango tip for you. And spoiler alert, it involves one of my favorite activities, shopping. Stay tuned. My journey in tango really started when I first moved to New York City. Before coming to New York City, I lived in Portland, Oregon. And even though they had a very active tango community, I had my group of friends and tango wasn't really an interest any of my friends had. In Portland, it was all craft IPAs and food carts and the occasional trip to the coast. But all of that changed when I came to New York City. All of a sudden, I was in the big city with new friends, new hobbies, and I had no idea what Williamsburg was. So all of a sudden, my life was a blank slate. The chance encounter that led me down the path of tango happened a few weeks after I settled into my life in New York. One of my coworkers invited me to her birthday party, and she was living a classic New York City movie life. She graduated from Columbia with honors and became a successful journalist before being poached by her current firm to hobnob with the most exciting startups and VCs in the city. So I was really excited to go to her birthday party and meet some very interesting people. The plan was to meet at a very old pizza place on the east side of Brooklyn Bridge. Walk across, take pictures with iconic backdrops, then go to a dessert shop in Soho. The pizza was amazing. Until then, I didn't really get the hype of New York City thin crust pizza, but this place had it all: the chewy dough, the flavorful sauce, the unique crunchy texture of the crust, and the beer was really, really good too. Unfortunately for the group, the next step didn't quite go as planned. You see, the Brooklyn Bridge, even the pedestrian part, is huge, and it's surprisingly easy to get separated from your group. And that day, in my state of culinary bliss, I ended up separated from the group, walking down with another party goer who made very similar unfortunate turns. As we walked down the Brooklyn Bridge, the bright skyline of Manhattan slowly drifting closer, we exchanged stories of how we got to New York City. How we were liking it, what we wanted to do there. He also considered himself a transplant, just like me. But from his stories, I could tell that he embraced New York City with an enthusiasm that I found quite admirable. Similar to the birthday girl, he also came to New York City for Columbia. And as soon as he got here, he fell in love with the cosmopolitan hustle and bustle of New York. He fell in love with jazz, which brought him not just to the jazz clubs of Lower East Side. But also to those of New Orleans, he became enamored with the Caribbean culture of New York and visited Cuba and Dominican Republic to further his understanding. While I was not really quite ready to emulate many of his pursuits, there was one that I thought I could emulate: tango. He told me how, even though he really loved music and dance, he never received any systematic training. And how someone with a Groupon convinced him to try tango, and after his first class, he was hooked. And he offered to introduce me to the studio where he took lessons, the Jenny Breen Tango Academy. With some trepidation, I showed up to my first class. As soon as I stepped into the room, I knew this was a world I'd never seen before. The crackly music, reminiscent of a 1930s gramophone, permeated the air. The warm, dim light cast a mysterious glow over the dance floor, where senior students practiced intricate turns and sweeps that seemed to me at the time borderline dangerous. And as I stood a bit lost, looking for a familiar face, the head instructor Jenny Breen, an elegant, athletic woman whose powerful figure once dominated New York's jazz and modern dance scene, introduced herself with a hug. The first class was challenging. But I left the studio feeling energized, with a strong desire to learn more. More so than the dance itself, what really got me coming back to the studio week after week, month after month, was the amazing community that she fostered among her students. I met people from all walks of life, 
a brilliant landscape architect who designed some of the most iconic public spaces in New York, a punk metal vocalist with a cult following the underground concerts of Brooklyn, or a sociologist with the United Nations whose work kept aid organizations accountable. People whom I would have never met had I not danced tango, all drawn together for this amazing activity. As I developed my skill in tango and became more involved in the community, I wanted to be more than just a dancer. I wanted to help shape and create the community that I'd become a part of. Around this time, Jenny was planning on opening a milanga, which is a tango social where people could come together to dance, mingle, and get to know one another. It's truly the heart of tango. I offered to be an organizer for the milanga, and next thing I knew, I was in the business of tango. Organizing is hard work. You put in a lot of hours and your reward varies greatly from week to week. But it was one of the best things I could have done for my tango career. I met so many people from the New York community. Being one of the three hosts, I had the chance to actually meet and talk to the people who came to our milonga from all corners of the world. I also built really deep relationships with the people who volunteered at the milonga. We'd come about an hour before the milonga to set up, we'd dance and keep the milonga going, and afterwards we'd go out for a late dinner and drinks. Over the course of our running the milonga, we must have eaten at every restaurant in St. Mark's several times over, from one Japanese kebab restaurant that serves sake cocktails with a grapefruit and a juicer for you to juice fresh, so the Afghan restaurant was every kind of palaf from the best mantu in town. But most importantly, Allison, I met you. And it's because we met that we're able to build this wonderful podcast together. Hi, Sean. Hi, Allison. Wow, thank you so much for this story. It was so fun to learn about how you came to Tango, because by the time I got to that practica, it seemed like you had been there forever. <laughs> oh, thank you. You know, I really admired that spirit of exploration and that enthusiasm you had. You seemed primed at that point in your life to discover something new. But for someone listening, what advice would you have? Because someone might feel stuck in their life or in a routine. So how to break out of that into this sort of energy that you had? Oh, man, yeah, that's such a good question. Because, well, I don't think people ever get out of feeling that way in life, really. But in terms of discovering something new or finding a new passion, I think it's important to think about the Japanese idea of deai which is word, the, the word for encountering. So it's a word that condenses this idea that a lot of where we are now in life is the result of the encounters that we have that take our life down different paths. So sometimes we can will our next chapter into existence, pull yourself up by your bootstrap, that very American way of thinking. But Sometimes I think the exciting chapters are really opened by someone else, whether it's a person who you accidentally share a Brooklyn Bridge walk with, or then that person introduces your tango, or someone that you made acquaintance with for a while and you really admire their dancing, but then that friendship really deepens during the pandemic and they start a tango podcast with you. It's really these unexpected encounters that really make life magical. So I would say to people, treasure your deais, all of your encounters, because every person you meet can be a doorway to something new. And that's what happened with me. Oh, wow. That is such beautiful advice. And I definitely appreciated all of our encounters. So mm -hmm. another thing that came up is that, you know, you mentioned NYC, and it just sounds like there was that energy, that hustle and bustle. So in your mind, is that now inextricably linked with tango? Mm. That's, that's also a really good question. I mean, one of my favorite moments in New York City that recurs is when you walk into an elegant restaurant or an elegant hotel from a busy midtown street, when the sound of the city just fades away so fast that it catches you off guard and the harsh light of the city give way to that warm glow and the people are relaxed in stark contrast to the rushing about energy that you take on by osmosis when you rush down the streets. And slowly as you settle your breath, you start to feel at home. And Tango for me is a lot more like that. It's a world away from the world. 
you could be in a place like London or Barcelona and you can find someone, take the embrace and share a nonverbal conversation like you've known each other for a long time. And suddenly a movement reminds you of a meek, weekly milonga back home. And then all of a sudden the city doesn't feel as foreign anymore. So that kind of energy is always what tango has been for me. It's always been more of a counterpoint to the hustle and bustle. Oh, I love that. And I definitely know that feeling of coming in off of off of a busy street into a whole new sort of energy. So, oh, I love it. And, you know, in addition, Sean, I got such a sense of community from listening to that description of the studio. And, and it wasn't just because I had been there, too. So I really admire how you took responsibility to create this dance for not just yourself, but for others. How did you find the courage to do that? Because, you know, I would have been so shy. What would you tell tango students coming up? That's an interesting question, Allison. I was uh, pretty into organizing events back in the day. You know, back in Portland, we ended up having these weekly potlucks in my tiny, tiny apartment in Southeast Portland with a bunch of international students from Portland, Uni uh, Portland State University, where my girlfriend worked, and Lewis and Clark College, where I worked. And I just loved the energy of being with people and creating an environment where a community could happen. And I think once you're part of a community for a while, you really want to start to give back and contribute. And this was one of the ways I could really give back to Tango. And one of the reasons hosting appealed to me actually is that I am sort of similar to you, fairly reserved. I'm not a big, oh, look at me, I wanna be the center of attention kind of person. So hosting was a good way for me to be more involved with the community and be with the people and contribute to the sense of community that was there. Oh, I love that. That is such a great way to do that. And, and being a host really is a unique position in the room. So what was that like? And what sort of social obligations does a host have? Well, being a host is certainly a very unique position in the room, but I'm not sure I'm the best host out there. Uh, I really like the work of a lot of different New York City hosts like Adam and Chico, Fausto Vasquez, Michelle Lam and Tina Herrer, and, and we'll talk about them in future episodes. But they really go out of their way to make you feel welcome, to set up the event, to make sure everything goes well. And they do a lot of planning and marketing to create a community around their events, even before the events take place. So for me, I usually just try to say hi to new faces and people who are there, make sure everyone is having a good time. Um, for example, one instance that I really appreciated from another host was that time I went to Victoria Coder's Milanga on Friday and she pulled me into the dance floor for a tanda to introduce herself and make sure people saw me dancing. And I thought that was just so neat. And then afterwards, John Tarek, another teacher, found me and told me about all these events happening in the city. You know, I've been away from New York City for a while and I was just coming back and I think I look like a new face. So these teachers really went out of their ways to make me feel welcome. And I really appreciate that. I think it's also important not to overdo it because some people just want to dance and not get into a big conversation with the host. So it's about kind of reading the room, reading the energy of the people and not being intrusive. But when people are just kind of sitting, definitely go introduce yourself and be friendly. For sure, for sure. That welcoming presence is such an important part in our tango journeys and sometimes we really need that so that's wonderful work that they all did and that you did as well so yeah and i don't want to spoil it for the future readers but i definitely since i've been doing this podcast with you i've been following an adage that you live by which is bring the party wherever you are yes. so when i host i try to i try to be the person that gives that energy instead of be the person that's looking for that energy i love it i love it I love it. And yeah. that'll be such a such a great teaser. You'll just have to, to stay tuned, listeners, and you'll you'll hear all about that tango tip as well. Yeah, listen to all of the episodes that we have to figure out where Allison says this is a <laughs> really, really great tango tip. <laughs> well thanks. And you know, what are you excited about in your next chapter? Well, I am really excited about this podcast because I've always really enjoyed writing and speaking as a way to express my passion, and my emotions, and I'm really looking forward to diving further into various Tango topics with you and our guests. Well, me too.
So, listeners, it is now time for our Tango Tip of the Week. This week, we have Allison, who has a wonderful tip for us. So, Allison, what is your Tango Tip of the Week? My Tango Tip of the Week, Sean, is dress up. Dress up. That sounds like a great idea. But I want to hear from you. Why should we dress up? Well, the other day, you and I were talking about how to get dances, especially mm-hmm. as a beginner or if you are beginning in a new place. And dressing up is just an easy and fun way to signal to the others that you are serious. Hmm. Yeah, that's so true. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I know that yoga pants are always comfortable, and maybe mm-hmm. you started out by going to tango classes in that way, but this started out as a social dance. You know, this started out as a scene and a place to meet people. And, you know, you're going to dance tango. You never know what could happen. And you've been working on your moves all week, so now it's time to show them off. And it's best to show them off in the nicest package possible. Nicest package possible. That's exactly right. So what kind of outfits are we talking about? Well, not many of us have big ball gowns or tuxes in the closet, which is fine because you really couldn't dance tango in a ball gown anyways. Mm-hmm. All you really need is your, your legs free, and you don't want the tip of your heel to get caught in your skirt either. So I find the ideal length is a knee-length skirt, so just a nice knee-length skirt or dress. Yes, knee-length skirts. That's really true. I never thought about that technical consideration. Uh, but, you know, now that we're talking about tango skirts, what do you think of the tango skirts and tango brands that you often see sold at Milongas or online? I love to shop for those kinds of skirts because by getting tango-specific clothes, you go the extra mile of signaling because someone will see you and realize, oh, they must be serious because mm. they spent this money, because they were at a Malanga at least once in their life, or even just Googled tango skirts and they knew what to look for online. So maybe I'll take a chance with that woman, even though I've never mm. seen her face at this Malanga before. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I, it's never explicit, but I've definitely made that calculation before. So it's a very quick and easy way to get more dances. Exactly. And it's not often in life or in tango that you can take such shortcuts. So you might as well take advantage of this one. Because, for example, you can't get stronger legs overnight. You can't get killer abs overnight. But you can get new clothes overnight. That's true. That's true. But, you know, five fifty, five ninety nine, six payments, you can probably do that with one of those infomercial ones. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. You never know what you yeah, can buy yeah. these days. But no, what you said is absolutely true. It's uh, new clothes overnight. Great way to show yourself off and nice package, right? Right. So so we were, ta- we were talking about tango specific clothes. And I wanted to ask you because I have very little experience with this particular consideration. What are some characteristics of a tangle skirt? Well, what I have in mind, what's been popular for the last two years at least, picture a fabric that is a soft knit, so it has an inherent stretch to it. Mm. Often the front of the skirt is sort of a squarish piece that goes straight down to the knees. But then in the back, there's more fabric, so, and it's been sewn together so that there's pretty folds. Often it comes to a V-shape in the back. And so mm-hmm. the effect is such that as you move, it sort of flares out and opens up more. And that is very unique to tango skirts. Huh. You know, I think I've seen those. A lot of professionals, especially professionals that only do tango, they seem to like those. Yeah. And of course, the trends are always changing. So it's going to be really fun to see what designers come up with in the future. But, you know, another type is the classic pencil skirt. So picture a form-fitting skirt that goes straight down to the knees. Huh. Wait, wait. So... I'm, I'm going to ask a question then about that pencil skirt because wouldn't that make it really hard to do some very, what I consider to be classic tango moves like ganchos, boleos, these big kicks? Yeah, so that's the thing though. It does make those moves difficult. However, yeah. this can go with the more milonguera style because rumor has it that the women used to practice with a coin between their knees and the coin Uh. wasn't supposed to fall down. I know, I know. And now there's, okay, there's all sorts of skeletal alignment reasons why I think that exercise wouldn't work for anyone, but Uh. you get an idea of the vibe they were going for and the culture. And so, for example, picture a kick like Noelia or Dado sometimes does where the kick is from the knee. 
versus mm. what Juana Sepulveda often does where the hip joint moves. Then picture a pencil skirt versus a flowy skirt. Mm -hmm. So I just think it's neat to see how fashion has adapted to moves and vice versa. And so even though I normally, because 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 my kicks are pretty high, I would mm -hmm. need a skirt that's a little bit more flowy. But it's just kind of neat to to go back in time and, and see these different styles and, you know, to pay homage sometimes. Wow. Oh, you know what you said? That definitely makes a lot of sense that you could have somebody do a style like Noelia or another style kind of like Juana, and that's dependent on what their backgrounds and stylistic preferences are. And they have the choice of going with one style of clothing or another style of clothing, but they both look very iconic and very tango. Exactly, exactly. It's yeah. lots of fun. So I wanted to kind of ask, uh, piggyback off of that topic a little bit when you talked about tango-specific fashion and how they come from styles. Do you think that the fashion came first and people invented styles and movements to capitalize on it? Or do you think that the style existed first and then they made fashion specifically for it? Oh, man. I'm really not sure. I think it's one of those chicken and the egg things. But I just have always found it fascinating the way different parts of cultures evolve together and adapt to each other. And just to be clear, you don't have to go out and spend tons of money right away. As long as you just dress up a little in nicer clothes that you already own, that can also get the job done. And it goes for men, too. Because if I see a man in a suit, my thinking is he has just showered recently and probably smells nice because usually those things go along with suits. So it looks like you're ready to party and are familiar with the tango scene. Yes, indeed. All right. Well, that's great advice. So there you have it. Our tango tip of the week, dress up. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Let's Talk Tango with Sean and Allison. You can write to us at letstalktango at gmail.com, tweet us at letstalktangosa, or find us on Instagram at let's underscore talk underscore tango. Music in this episode includes Loca by Juan D'Arienzo, Derecho Viejo by Juan de Caro, and are in the public domain. Other music is licensed through Storyblocks. See you next week. <laughs>